which is in March. Uh, everybody was working from home. Um, and we opened again at the beginning of September. Um, the idea is that we would encourage people to still work from home, but could come to work if they wished. Um, we worked really hard to put in place social distancing measures in the office, one-way systems, masks when you're not at your desk, closing alternate desks, tense cleaning. But what was really surprising is when we opened again after six months, very few people came back. We had 12 people out of a total of 650 that came back in September. Uh, actually into the office and in fact we're now what, a, a month on after reopening and we're getting less than 50 people a day choosing to come into work now of course the pandemic's going to be responsible for that choice for a lot of people but m my view and the informed view is that that's a trend that will continue and that in fact most people will elect to spend the majority of their working time at home and, and not in the office uh, because the take up, frankly, has been so low. Um, well, would, would that have happened anyway, irrespective of COVID 19? And, and, and my view is um, yes, it would, certainly from Waiton's perspective, and, and, and most of our the big law firms in Liverpool. Um, all that COVID has really done is accelerated that new way of working rather than force it. So what do I mean by that? Well, to give you an example, um, prior to September last year, September 19, we had three football sized pitch floors at the plaza. And on the bottom floor was our client suite. So we we're accommodating our 650 employees on two football size floors. Um, we did a deal with BT to sublet our whole second floor to BT. And the deal was that they wanted a six month turnaround. So um, that forced us really to do what we were planning for a while, which is go agile working. So we had a six month project in September and this was before COVID was ever really heard about. Uh, I'd like to say we had the foresight and could see into the future, but, but we didn't. It was driven by the deal to, to, to sublet our second floor to, to, to BT with a six month turnaround. And so we kitted everybody out with a laptop. Um, every employee got an allowance for a home office. They got an allowance of, um, I think it was just under 500 pounds to spend it in, it, which, in it, whichever way they wished to kit out their home office. Um, we went paper light, which for a law firm is, is, is quite good because we are obviously document heavy with all our cases and, and we've gone completely paper light now, which is obviously saving on office space and also the, helps with the ability to work remotely. Um, and we, we opened our new space on the first floor. So a comment, what was previously two floors for 650 people. We now have a first floor space that can accommodate 300 on, on any one day with hot desk in, an emphasis on working from home, clever office design. And frankly, that is saving us one million pounds a year um, in, in not having that second floor. And that was all done before we even thought about COVID. And what was bonkers was that on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, I uh, remember it well, um, postman didn't come to me by the way but 14th of February we had a ribbon cutting on our new office space introducing the agile working the emphasis on working from home and four weeks later we were in lockdown um, and I suppose the point is really that, that, that the lockdown has really just as I said before for us has accelerated the new way of working not, not forced it um, what, what, what might that mean then for the, um, for the business, the wider fabric of the city? Well, actually, moving forward, we're likely to need even the smaller space we've got. So I, I just wonder how that's going to impact on a surplus of office space in Liverpool with people, it seems, certainly in our firm, electing to work from home most of the time, uh, that pattern continuing despite just what eight months ago halving our space for the same number of people and with growth plans 
we're not going to need all of that. That could be a problem, surplus office space. Um, good news, I suppose, for people is that work-life balance. Um, the people, you know, um, everybody in my team seems to have got a dog over the last uh, few months. So that's a good reason to be at home. Uh, obviously, not commuting is a fantastic reason. All the obvious things. So that might be good. But then how do you keep that buzz alive in the firm? Any thoughts on that would be um, most welcome and and i suppose um just to finish my session what what have we learned during the pandemic well the big thing i've learned is is communication with our staff because obviously there was a lot of uncertainty um in in march april a lot of uncertainty and we uh, approached our staff um uh, well, we, we reviewed our budget first of all. Our budget for the year was 108 million, and we reviewed that down to 80 million. So we anticipated a 20 million pound um, budget deficit for this year. We approached our staff and asked them to um, agree to a pay reduction. <clears throat> and the thing that I've learned is the, the way you do that, leading from the top with the, uh, the board, the way they communicated it. We asked 1,200 people to do a pay reduction and they all agreed. Um, that was a fantastic lesson for me that in how you get your staff to buy in and to get 1,200 people to every single one agree a 20% pay reduction it was a fantastic lesson and how that was done. And in fact, just to finish my piece, um, that, that we have done better than we thought. Um, the work has um, not diminished to the level we thought. We've obviously been making, able to make lots of savings in other areas. And in fact, we've restored people's pay from the 1st of September. Uh, and so that's a lesson that really um, I've learned in, in engaging with your staff and how to do that. How, how do you get people to buy in to, 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 to the pay cut? Uh, and, I, and I'm happy to share some stories on that. And, and finally, um, I've learned about Zoom etiquette, and I have um, some um, fantastic stories of um, court hearings that I've done on, um, over video, uh, which I, again, in February, never done one before, never thought I would be doing that. So if anybody wants to hear them, drop me a line on the, uh, on the, on the chat, and I'll tell you my story about the miniature dash hunt and the judge in Watford. But, uh, Happy to take any questions. I hope that gives you an insight from Waitman's um, large national law firm. And, and it's largely positive um, for us. And we are doing much better than we thought we would be when we asked people to take the voluntary pay cut, when we slashed our budget, and when we closed our office. Um, so I hope that helps uh, Dinah. And uh, of course, happy to deal with any questions. Thank you, Steve. Lots to think about there. Really thought provoking. Um, so questions already coming in. We'll deal with those at the end of the session. Keep putting your questions in the Q&A facility. But now I'm going to turn to Joanna. Great. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. About five years ago, almost exactly, I published a book that was based on interviews I'd done um, with people across the UK. Several years I went to speak to all sorts of different people from a ballet dancer to a footballer to a care worker to a mum and I've been thinking a lot again about that with people that I met and one of the most memorable encounters was with Rochelle Monte, a care worker in Newcastle and what I remember most vividly is that she really loved her work, it was, um, she hadn't it, it absolutely loved what she did but she was put under incredible strain by the working conditions she was under a zero hours contract which basically meant that she would from she would get her rota and it would be a 12 day on two day off and then with this incredible thing called a split shift where she'd start at 7 a.m and then stop in the middle of the day and then go back to work to about 10 p.m often that would happen at weekends she'd be so busy that she just wouldn't even have a chance to eat her lunch she um she had no allowance for things like mileage um, she was using her own car to drive around Newcastle, um, her uniform and her phone, things like that. 
Um, and she felt that the private care companies that employed her just relied on the fact that she couldn't leave someone unfed and unwashed. And so she ended up doing all this unpaid overtime. And as far as she was concerned, basically society didn't see her work and valued it even less. And there was one point, particularly I remember in the interview, where she called her young children over. And I'm going to read from the book so I don't misquote her. So she said to me, it's terrible what my children think I do. I'm not going to do the accent. Um, her daughter, her son and their friend run in. What does mummy do when she goes to work? Wipe bums. What do I do? Uh, wipe bums. And then we all ended up laughing. I asked them, what do they want to be when they're older to the children? Her daughter says a doctor, her friend a swimming teacher, no, hang on, a ballet teacher, and Monte's four-year-old, who'd been actually, actually scaring the older girls with his impression of a monster this afternoon, says, a knight. What does Monte say she does? This is Monte speaking. I get really annoyed with myself because when people ask, I say, I'm just a care worker. I'm trying not to. Care work. We're at the bottom of the pile. We always have been. And people judge you because of it. I suppose I judge myself because of it as well. So it's astonishing to me how much has changed in such a short time that the coronavirus crisis should almost change the values we bear on work completely, upend them completely. I was just thinking if I told Michelle at the time that we would be clapping her weekly, she would just laughed in my face and I would have laughed too. It just seems incredible to me. So when I look at the rising unemployment figures, when I realize, see all these um, news articles about women being set down maybe a decade um, because of the, the changes to work, um, and that's not even mentioning all the people who've died and all the people who've sick and long COVID and all those things, I try and remember that the change to the values of work and what we value society is has shaken things up profoundly and hopefully in a way that will last. I was thinking about what the idea of key workers were. Key workers didn't turn out, it was the people at the top of society who get paid lots. Key workers were care workers, health workers, all sorts of drivers, taxi drivers, delivery drivers, um, postmen, security guards, not the best paid people in the society and not lauded. And I mean, these, these are the professions that you see in the ONS figures when you look at who has died and why, like they were 74% up on last year, the number of care workers in that period from, who died from period from March to May. Um, and those are all the jobs that are in those figures. These are the care key workers. These are the people who matter and it matters that we change society so that they know that they're valued and that we value them properly with money and um, a proper welfare state. One of the things I'm very passionate about, um, I didn't know this five years ago when I spoke to Rochelle Monte, the care worker, but my mother um, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and so I spent a lot of time in these past few years with carers with her at home and carers with her in a care home and um, it's been very difficult seeing people who can't afford um, dental work having to glue their teeth back in with super glue and things like this because they just are not paid enough or not paid properly and one of the things I'm passionate about is a, um, a national care system that properly integrates with the national health system that wraps around from nurseries all the way to kind of proper care homes at the end of people's lives and I hope that this, this moment the clapping we did every week the thinking we've done about this will mean that there is a kind of opens the Overton window this possibility to be able to talk about what care does in our society is for so long women's work and care has been the one of the most important pillars of that has been undervalued by society and um hopefully this will change that um so that's what i'm hopeful for um another one of the things i've thought about a lot when thinking again about the book and all the people that i met five years ago was i saw these amazing workplaces um I just went to Aston Villa's training ground, sorry Liverpool, um, uh, to uh, the car factory, we're seeing all the robots that make um, mini cars, um, backstage at the Royal Opera House, um, just people's, all sorts of these amazing workplaces and thinking a lot about the shift to homework and um, what effects that might have on all sorts of people that we don't necessarily think about. So um, I was thinking about people who live alone, that kind of loneliness, like it can be quite liberating if you're going to get a dog or have a you know you enjoy your partner but what about all the people who sort of who don't have that and don't 
that loneliness is quite very hard to offset for a long, long period. Um, I wonder about the commute in some ways, losing it can be sort of great. Um, I mean, you, maybe you spend, use those two hours to learn Russian, but um, also that that divide between the, the ends of the day is quite difficult to lose and what effect that might have. Um, I thought it was incredible really that the, that people thought that for months on end that people could teach their children as well as work. That seems basically impossible. And the strain that's put on um, families and women in particular is something that will, is it causing this exactly this lag behind women sort of going silent, women being set back 10 years from the workplace. Um, and oh, I just want to give a bit about, you know, working from home can be great if you have a space to work, if you have outside space, if you have, um, you know, if you have room, but what if you don't? What if you are just starting out at work and you have to zoom from your bedroom and sit on your bed and um, all of those things haven't really been properly, um, I don't know if the impact of those have been always properly thought about. Um, but then again, not to be too um, gloomy because I think um, you can either meet challenges and sink under them or you can try and confront them. And it has, it made me think a lot about an essay by E.P. Thompson about um, working in a, uh, in a pottery factory in the 1830s, so pre-industrial revolution. And people used to work with their families, so that often meant the children worked, um, women worked, they would do the kind of make the handles, um, do the spine work, and then the men would do the bigger work, making bowls and plates and things. But basically they would work long days um, and they would, um, keep they had this thing called Saint Monday and Saint Tuesday where they would basically not work so you'd have this a different blend between life and work that it wasn't ruled by um, you know 9am being the start of work and 6pm being the end that there was a kind of more flexibility that family friends um, shopping cooking all of those could be blended into the work day and that seems a quite exciting return to um, the time to avoiding the time discipline the industrial revolution and back to the pre-industrial revolution kind of flexibility um, also there's Keynes I mean I, I, people are always mentioning Keynes in his essay about how we were supposed to only be working 24 hours a week at this point in history um, which Homeworking has, you know, homeworking often means that you work longer because you roll out of bed and 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 turn on your Zoom screen. But what if we didn't? What if we did try to remember Keynes and think about how do we create a more sustainable life? Thinking about the climate, thinking about women, thinking about um, how we want to have a fairer society for um, people of colour, and all of those things to be more important than um, the capitalist imperative of earning more and more. Um, so yeah, that's that's some of the Thank you, Janet. Some huge questions to ponder there. Yeah, it's really great. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to turn to Asif. Asif, thank you. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody, for asking me to be on the panel. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by introducing myself and just talking. So I'm chair of the LEP and have been for three years. Um, my role is predominantly, or our role within the LEP is to provide a platform for business. Um, both to give insight and help um, shape the city region's economy and policy. Um, we provide an interface between large corporates to small SMEs trying to be competitive, to survive, to make profit in our city region. And we have public sector policymakers and leaders sitting on here. Um, we do that through our main board. We have a number of people on our main board. We all within our city region, John Higg, the League of Mark Whitworth from Peel Port. Um, and of course, we've got Dame Janet Beerham there as well. We have a further eight sub-boards representing sector leaders, including a number from the university as well. Um, but I also have a main, I also have a day job, just like all the other board members. Mine's been the founder and CEO of the Contact Company, which is one of the UK's largest owned BP operations, which I started 15 years ago, and now employs about 2,000 people, working across some of the national brands like John Lewis, River Island, Argos, Moon Pig, which are all based here in our city region. And actually, we don't actually know that, but they are based within our city region. Um, but I think I'm here on this panel today to prov provide more of a commercial view from a private sector on, uh, at a ground level, really. So in the short time I've, I've, I've got, I'm just going to give you some observations from what I've seen firsthand in my business and also heard from board members about the changes to work in the pandemic and also what opportunities may be there in the city region, because I think that's very important to cover. 
So what change have we seen so far in the pandemic in the Liverpool City region? We've seen huge changes across a wide range of sectors from office through to retail and manufacturing. Some of these changes I believe will be temporary, others will be permanent. Most will be a hybrid of the two as we heard earlier from, from Steve as well. In most cases, the pandemic has accelerated many trends which we already know are underway. Flexible office working, online retail, digitalization and businessly, especially manufacturing. Um, Stains are structural and some of these are not going to come back and not going to be reversed after the pandemic in my view. Some changes, however, such as leisure and hospitality, where to be honest, we're all craving a holiday. A pint at the bar, a match or a concert with friends. Um, I'll touch on offices. Most office-based companies in the city region who set up their staff to work from home did so, as they were required to do before the lockdown. Only those that couldn't function effectively from home were able to work in office. My business is one of those, and I'll come back onto that in a minute. For most of us that have worked um, better than what they hoped, actually, the acceleration was unbelievable through Zoom, Zoom, Teams, and we all found we could meet lots of people and attend loads of meetings without actually having to leave the kitchen table. We found we could function, in some cases, be more pro productive by eliminating travel and working on emails while being in meetings. I mean, I can say I've not traveled on a plane since January this year, which is the first time I've never done that in 20 years. Um, in August, many people were planning significant returns to the office, as Steve said, despite ongoing risks in transport. But this is now largely back in retreat, with many resigned to working from home until the spring now. There's lots to talk about the benefits in productivity of working from home and opening wider knowledge pools. But there are real challenges as well. And I think, you know, Joanna touched on that. There's real challenges. Mental and health well-being is a major concern with many people feeling isolated. In creative sectors, many businesses are finding the creative process eroded by the lack of creative interaction with people and in groups. And homeworking may suit some people it may suit some organisations, but it doesn't suit a lot of people as well. But what about the new starters who are trying to go into jobs and starting with jobs? It's very, very challenging to get them to work from home. So the future's blended for most, I think. Possibly a smaller office, a more spacious, flexible working environment, social networking space. Not just a space to sit at your desk and computer all day, as you can do that at home. Offices will become places you really want to go to. To meet colleagues, work on projects together, meet clients, partners, to create and build them relationships, which we've suddenly lost over the last few months. For me, the future of office is exciting. I'm an entrepreneur, and for me, changes create an opportunity. Um, in my business, we had to restructure office to be COVID safe at great expense. And we've been through some homework in where it worked for some staff and some others. We had 350 people go to work at home and 50% of them people wanted to come back and we had to change and revolve. Um, but we had to keep trading, you know, and I think we were doing online grocery orders and a whole range of services, including some government projects. But shops were shut, everybody had to buy online. We had to handle the orders and the warehouses and the drivers and I had to arrange delivery everything when ordering. So it brings me very adaptly on to retail. Um, the shift to home shopping is a permanent one. It's been coming. It's now embedded in our DNA. The only question is what percentage does it represent going forward? This means we need to repurpose some of our retail space. It means opportunities for independent retailers working alongside hospitality to create experience that you can only get, you can't get from your armchair or ordering from Amazon. We still want to shop. But in great places like Liverpool One, when we talk our great city region, the experience is high quality. Footfall there in the summer was up pre-COVID levels, which speaks for a positive future for the right players and the right quality. But it also means that delivery drivers, automated warehouses, local delivery centres, and jobs associated with them will grow as retails decline. Manufacturing. In manufacturing, there has been a steady rise in digitalization. Business is getting more processes to be digitally controlled, measured, modeled, and improved. 
in a highly competitive world that has been digitalizing quicker than the UK, we need to embrace this to keep up, to compete and continue to win market share. The pandemic has accelerated that process. Digital skills are a must have for employees and they're looking for application of software and digital systems. Many fear this will be widespread losses, failure to adapt to the competitive gains it will give will be far greater job losses. But this is something we need to really consider for the future. And I'm concerned about the digital divide in our city region. Too many youngsters in poorer households don't have access to phones, laptops and internet to build these skills. And that's something we've got to address and look at. Um, my thoughts about the future, it's a cliche, but many things will change. But also many will say the same. <clears throat> we really must place much more value on the frontline worker in NHS and the care sector and remunerate them accordingly. We need to look at how to become better businesses, more inclusive, sustainable. And I would urge you all to register to take part in tomorrow's festival which we're supporting build back better has become a national slogan adapted by government to be meaningful it needs to really deliver and not be a slogan it should incorporate and encompass a future where business can be profitable and sustainable but not at any cost where the people who provide our food clean our workplaces empty our bins deliver parcels and look after us when we're ill a service which often take for granted and are treated and paid at a level that reflects the valuable roles that perform, as Joanne quite rightly said. Where budding entrepreneurs of any age, stage and postcode can grasp the new opportunities presented by the changing needs and behaviours that we see emerging. I want to see entrepreneurs of the future. I want to see people from every religion, colour, ethnicity, every single social angle be able to be a budding entrepreneur and take their ideas forward where people can be employed in meaningful jobs and pursue their dreams and careers, but still have left time left in the day to spend with their families and friends, where young people can fulfill their true potential and where being digitally enabled means more fulfilling and better paid work. In this emerging new world, the pillars of our local industrial strategy, clean growth, digital health, innovation, advanced materials and manufacturing will be important forever, providing with us a strong framework on which to build back better. We're well placed in our Liverpool city region to take advantage of the many trends taking place and not least the shift to greater homework in nationally. If you have a job in London and live in Liverpool, your cost of living will be much less and you'll be able to enjoy all the benefits our great city region has got to offer. I think the quality of life and value for money will make us inherently attractive and should increase our population. We must cherish our culture, our open spaces, the livability of our city region and most importantly, a hospitality sector. I firmly believe that the loss of business jobs we are seeing in this sector is temporary, and that we'll see a huge resurgence in this sector, and we need to be ready for it. So that's one of the reasons I wrote to the Chancellor asking to support you know, the brunt of the lockdown to protect public health. That's why I'm falling back in the Metro Mayor and the local authority leaders and establish a fund to support this sector through the lockdown. Without support, we risk eroding productivity capability of this sector and be less able to bounce back. I could go on for much longer. These are challenging times, but in such times we need to be clear sighted, be bold, be positive, take the challenges, see the opportunities in front of us before others do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asif, again, a huge amount to think about there. And thanks to all three of our panelists. We've covered between us a great deal of ground. So now it's time for your questions. We will, between us, try to answer as many as we can. We may not be able to get to everyone, but we'll do what we can. So don't forget, keep your questions coming through the Q&A facility. There are some common themes in the questions, so I might pick up some of those alongside individual questions. So um, I'm going to begin by questions that address the consequences of home working. Lorraine, for instance, um, mentions a, um, um, a concept that, that Joanna addresses. What about those who are not able to work from home? 
And there are also questions coming in um, about potential challenges in home working. Jason, for instance, asking about the need to um, keep yourself healthy and well while working at home, exercising, taking walks, health and well-being, which picks up a point that, that Asif made um, about um, um, mental health, how important that is. So let's begin with home working, its effects and consequences. Um, Joanna, I'll start with you. Any thoughts on that issue? <clears throat> I'm glad they, um, it was it Jason who brought up about healthy, being healthy at home. I think that is a real challenge. Um, I think you, naturally when you're moving around the city or a place where you're working, workplace, all sorts of that happens naturally. I think you have to be conscious about it. I guess that's what lots of people have found out. I'd be interested to hear what Steve and Asif have heard about um, what people have been doing at Waitmans and what people have been doing in, in across Liverpool. Um, and not that this is a <laughs> kind of health thing, but I know that they, um, having a structure can be really helpful. So making sure that you, uh, lots of friends of mine have um, followed yoga with Adrian videos in the morning or making sure that they take a walk at lunchtime and just having some structure around it. I, but I think it's a challenge. I think it's really, really difficult. Um, and mental health is as well. Um, I know that um, I, I work for a magazine called the London Review of Books and they have um, made a conscious effort to help people's mental health and um, offered um, things like therapy and make sure that we can sort of see each other and talk to each other. And I think that's a really important support to have now too as well. Um, uh, yeah, that was my thoughts yeah. about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Steve, any comments to add? <clears throat> yeah, it, it's something that at Waitman's we've been really alive to and uh, as I said before I, I, I read on on our campaigns one of which is mental health awareness and we um, we appointed um, 20 mental health first aiders in Liverpool and um, one of the things we've done is, is, is <coughs> empower those mental health first aiders to connect with our people at home and put in place a mechanism whereby they can call, have Zoom meetings with their mental health, with a mental health first um, And that's been really successful. Um, I think that um, offering people a choice that we, we have fortunately been able to do from September of if you want to come into the office, you can. If you prefer to stay at home, you can't. It, it, it's helped because um, certainly uh, me, for example, um, I have chosen to come into the office a, it feels really, really safe, uh, mainly because there are so few people here. But B, um, I couldn't regulate my working hours at home. Um, I was um, picking up my guitar at 10 o'clock, then trying to do some work, then going for a run around Sefton Park at 2 o'clock, and then you end up working until sort of 10 o'clock at night. Whereas in the office, we've got to be out by 5.30 because of the cleaners coming in. And that personally has helped me. So I think offering people a choice if you can do that is is a big thing and it's shifting that emphasis in, in teams because everybody waitman's works in the teams we don't have any offices anymore it's shifting that emphasis to team meetings being on, on zoom to making sure you have those every day making sure that your strategy and policy around team working changes to a home-based one and finally, uh, I suppose I, I would add this as well. Um, fr from an employment lawyer's perspective, um, this year has been the holy grail of employment law. I mean, I've been doing employment lawyer for 30 years and, and, and the furlough scheme and the challenges that from an employment perspective, um, this is thrown up, have been like a holy grail for employment lawyers. Uh, and um, whatever you may think about policy and the way the government have handled things so you may have a view on that well, one thing I, I can tell you is the furlough scheme has been um, a great success in that it's enabled businesses to retain employees and, and, and critically you say to the employee you cannot work you, there's no fudging it there's no halfway house you, if you're on furlough you cannot work you will get 80% of your salary, we're able to claim that back from the government grant, that sort of tailed off and ends this month. 
So that's a challenge. But I think people knowing that there's no halfway house, you're not doing a bit of work at home, then you haven't got any work. You're not at work. And that way people can plan their lives a little bit better. And the feedback I've been getting is the fur people have actually liked furlough. Um, and there's a half campaign that, well, can we have a month of furlough every year going forward, please? Um, but I think, you know, I think that and the grants that have been available and ASI, um, you know, has, has, has been, you know, important to that as well. And I, I went to a talk that ASI did recently. We talked about the grants that have been available to business and the furlough scheme. I think that's helped people cope with home because it's given them that certainty um, a, a, as well. So I um, hope that helps. But I, I think, you know, it, 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 the questions are well put because the challenges of people working at home when they, you know, they haven't got a network of um, friends or colleagues to sort of be there and just tap into it is a challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see one point that, that you made um, in relation to the challenges around home working, and I think it's a really important one, uh, is the difficulty for people joining those teams that Steve was talking about. Home working often is effective because we know our colleagues. We know what we're doing. We have those relationships already established. I think it can be really difficult for new people. Um, attempting um, to participate fully in an existing team. Um, it's, any thoughts as to how we might deal with challenges of that kind? Yeah, I mean, we just touching on what Steve said, I mean, to be honest, I mean we, we put into place, you know, I think approximately about 22 mental and health wellbeing champions, as we would call them in our business, where they were doing very Zoom calls and so forth and keeping in touch with some of the staff. We opened up hotlines. We've got a, we've got a page on our internet about working from home. But one of the quirky things that we did was um, we got Fitbits for a lot of the management team and we ran a Fitbit competition. So everybody on this steps. So it made you actually, because I, I employ a bunch of very competitive individuals and everybody wants to beat each other. So on a daily basis, you were, you were all linked in as friends. So everybody could see everybody's steps. And the conversation going to actually who's doing more steps. And you realize that people were knocking off at lunchtime and going for two or three mile walks. or somebody was going for a jog in the morning. So before they'd even started on the morning calls, somebody had done, you know, four or five mile jog. You know, let me tell you, I wasn't one of them. But some of them did do that. They'd gone a four or five mile jog. But... One of the things we've had to do, and this is not just our business down it, I think across the whole sectors, you've got to be creating agility. So agility is thinking outside that box. And one of the things we've learned is that actually, how do you, how do you bring somebody into your business? How can you teach them the culture? And one of the th a lot of the things we've done is we've gone onto line. So we've gone online with some of our training, but our training is live now. So therefore it's not done via an on, on, on system basics actually done via a screen so we've put a lot of video conferencing in so actually we've got a circle or a group of friends just as we're doing here where people are talking to each other so there's an interaction where people are training it doesn't give that, that, that physicality but it gives that mental stability to get people training so that's one of the areas we've done you know my honest opinion my personal opinion is there's nothing like having the face-to-face, -face, you know, as being a business guy, you know, to actually see somebody, see, you know, being with them and talking to them and, you know, but I think you have to adapt. So even in our business, we, we go through massive recruitment drives. We're having to interview people via Zoom. And then we're having to train people via Zoom for the people who are working at home. Yeah. But also the other thing, very importantly, it's, it's cutting down the ability for people to train as well. So you're training Rooms have gone, have gone smaller, you've got less capabilities of recruitment. So there's a lot of parameters surrounding that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Asi. Um, I'm going to turn now to a group of questions of really rather a practical kind uh, about work spaces. Mike, for instance, wonders what we might do with all of those redundant offices. Can we make something creative, something imaginative out of all that extra space? Um, and others are wondering about the practical implications of working from home. 
Um, Joanna, for instance, mentioned the difficulties of people trying to work from home with a laptop balanced on their knees in a bedroom. Now, is there anything that can be done um, to help people whose home facilities are not necessarily adequate? What, what implications are there? There are, there are a number of questions about as the physical workspaces as well as the intellectual, social, emotional workspaces. And of course, one of the implications of all those empty offices is the strain, as, as um, um, people have noted, um, um, Ronan, for instance, on the service industries that supported that office space. Um, the, the, the shops, the cafes, um, the restaurants. And so that's an associated challenge. Yeah, so um, um, Joanna, perhaps I'll start with you this time. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I just think it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, I don't know what you do if you haven't got a decent office. I, <laughs> and I hope it's not fully up to the workers because it should really be a joint um, yeah. decision. Um, I think the physical workspace is quite important for um, for for the transformation in your emotional and kind of intellectual kind of work. I think it is quite difficult to sit on the sofa or sit on the bed and try and be in a work mode. I think it's quite difficult to, and I think it's important. I'm not sure if we because we had it normally, we never really thought about what happened when we moved from our homes to the workplace and then tried to apply ourselves differently to the world, think about things differently, act differently, dress differently. I mean, you know, this, the yeah. cliche of sweatpants and you know, kind of proper clothes anymore. I, all those things do affect what you're able to do. Yeah, 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 I agree. Um, Asif, if any? thoughts on what we can do with all those empty offices yeah i think it's actually an opportunity i think i think just picking up what yeah. Anna said i think i think what you're going to have is a lot more mixed mm -hmm. office space i think you're going to have a lot of businesses sharing office space to create that that culture that environment that buzz mm -hmm. that environment of being in an office space i think you've got to create that not everybody has got digital connectivity when you look at us oh. just here now you know, you're always going to have people who are not going to have that digital connectivity and the stable, you know, I've been on many Zoom calls where, you know, I can hear somebody shouting at the kids to come off the Wi-Fi because there's not enough bandwidth for them to do the video conferencing calls. And I think, you know, many people yeah. in, you know, who are listening into this will be saying the same thing. So I think there's an ability to make sure we've got digital connectivity in our offices. We, 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 we repurpose some of their buildings to have shared space. I think Joanna's quite right. I mean, one of the things I've done as an individual is I've tried to keep my routine as I normally would do in the office. So I still get up in the morning, I still change, I still put a shirt on, I do all the things I'd normally do, just so I'm in the same temperament as I would do as I normally go into the office during the months when we were in lockdown. But I think, you know, it's, it's a matter of keeping yourself defined. I think looking at the space available in our city region, there is an opportunity to have more mixed office space. But the key is that if we do not get people out into the offices, the hospitality sector is going to carry on being hit. So it's really important. Everything has a knock on effect, not just on, not just on the, uh, on the hospitality sector, but on the mental health and well-being. As you quite rightly said, not everybody wants to work from home. Yeah. Want to work from, given the opportunity, yeah. but also have the enabling mm -hmm. of the to be able to get them to go into the office. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So I'm going to move on fairly briskly because I can see we're going to run out of time. Um, I'm, I'm turning now to a question from James, James Coe. I'm really picking up the point that you made, Joanna, um, about the implications of home working. Is there going to be a growth in that informal care sector? Um, women, perhaps particularly, trying to keep the home going while they're also trying to keep their paid jobs going, um, is there a real danger uh, that we will move backwards in terms of gender disparities um, in employment? Um, is that something that you might have noticed, picked up, Steve or Asif, in your um, work patterns, in your workforces? 
Steve, have you noticed that, that, that your female employers, employees have been feeling the strain more than your male employees and that might be affecting the ways in which your firm, Wakeman's, is um, impacted by the pandemic? Hmm. It's a really good question, James. Um, my, my honest answer is, uh, have I noticed any um, disparity between our female employees, our males? The honest answer is no, I haven't, um, from a Wakeman's perspective. Um, what, um, I think the, 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 the three things I have noticed, uh, first of all, that, um, that, that working from home is generally popular. The vast majority of our staff want to do it because of um, care responsibilities that they have, whether that's children picking them up from school, uh, children who um, at the moment have been sent home to self-isolate, whether it's elderly relatives, care responsibilities. So it, 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 generally people have, have welcomed it. Um, I, I, I haven't had anything feed, fed back to me that suggests our female staff are impacted any more than male, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on because I can see quite easily how that might happen. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We're almost out of time, but I can't resist going to a question. I um, can't quite find it now on the Q&A, but I know it's there. Wondering how people are going to meet their partners now that it's no longer possible to do so in the office. I mean, that's a serious question, but it does touch on something, doesn't it? That's actually really important. The workplace isn't just a workplace, and we know that. And it isn't just the, the search for romance. It's also all of those social and cultural networks around work that are going to shift and challenge um, and encounter challenges in our post-pandemic world. So I'm going to ask for a very, very brief comment from each of our panelists, how we really can think about making sure that our new workplace, however it's configured, doesn't turn out to be a lonely space. So, Asif, any quick thoughts on that? Um, actually, it's a very difficult question to answer, I think. The social yeah. aspect of work is very difficult. I mean, we, we haven't had a party in our place for for obviously since the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, you know, our summer fair, our winter, our Christmas, you know, where do we stand? I think it, I think it is a, it's a major, major worry. You know, but the one thing I do want to say, and, you know, bringing optimism into, into the whole conversation yeah. here, is, you know, we will come to the end of the pandemic. We yeah. will have something which will come in. We will have a vaccine. We will be able to meet people. We will be able to greet. We will be able to hug and kiss and do all the things we want to do. I'm not saying in the workplace, I'm saying generally. So just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not indicating that everybody should go and hug all their colleagues and start kissing them. So just to be clear, but I think yeah. you know, hopefully we'll come through it. I do think it's, it's very much a worry, you know, and I, you know, and I do feel it. I think that you've got to keep that social element and these type of things are great to do. So, you know, Thank you. I probably haven't answered the question, but you know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, very quick word from you. <clears throat> We've never really seen ourselves as a dating agency here at Waitman, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not so sure that, uh, although um, a lot of people have met their partners yep. uh, at, yep. at Waitman's, uh, I've got two of my team who are married, so um, I can see the, the force of the question. But I, I think the answer is, um, it, 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 it's a phrase we hear a lot, the, the new normal, the new way of working, and it's a challenge, isn't it? And I think that the question is, you know, keeping the buzz alive, um, yeah. meeting people, meeting new people, keeping that vibrance in your business, which is critical, however you do it, is a challenge. And, and I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I know one thing for sure, uh, we're up for it. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. Joanna, finally to you. Well, um, 
I was just going to add the kind of feminist killjoy point is that we had the Me Too scandal a few like a year ago. So maybe some of the romance at work is not like a great thing. But also I would say people fall in love in a million ways. Like I'm sure people can fall in love on Zoom, on Slack, on Twitter, on Instagram stories. Like I don't think we need to worry about people falling in love. Thank you. That's a great point to end with. And thanks to all three of you for really fantastic contributions. And thanks too for all of the um, questions that have come in. Thanks to all uh, participants and apologies to those of you, and I'm afraid there are many, who did not get their questions answered. Um, but we've all noted them and we'll all be thinking about them. Um, so we hope you will continue to participate in our Liverpool Responds events. Lots of other events going forward um, for the university. And I can't resist mentioning that we have our literary festival coming up this weekend. And there are some very exciting events there that you can sign up for, all free of charge. But meanwhile, thanks again to everyone. And have a very good day, whether you're working or whether you're not. Thanks again. Bye.